about you, but man, I need Jesus today. I need him every moment. I need him every hour. I need him every single day. He is the answer you need. He knows how to speak to you like nobody else knows how to speak to you. He knows what you're going through like nobody else knows what you're going through. He's the greatest counselor. Money could never buy his counsel. That's why he made it free for you. Because there's no way we could ever pay him for the things he gives us. But he made it free because of his son, because of Jesus. I'm, I just love Jesus today. Is anybody else so appreciative that God would come and visit us tonight? That he talked to us. All right. All right, let's talk tonight. Let's worship. Let's close our eyes. And I'm going to read a scripture over you real quick. Just a prequel thought, and then we'll sit down. Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Let me just read this over to you. Close your eyes as you're standing. Ask and keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who keeps on asking receives, receive this in your spirit, this is the word of God. And he who keeps on seeking finds. And to him who keeps on knocking, it will be opened. What man is there among you who if your son asks for bread, will instead give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will instead give him a snake? If you then, evil, sinful by nature as you are, know how to give good and advantageous gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, perfect as he is, give what is good and advantageous to those who keep on asking him? Receive that in your spirit tonight. Go ahead and be seated. Please understand something. I wanted to say before we get into the main part of the word, God was impressing something upon me. This scripture kept coming up. Many of you know my testimony. When I was born, I was born with water inside of my lungs and inside of my brain. I was blind. I was claimed as mentally retarded for the rest of my life. I was handicapped. I had water inside of my brain, so I had no control over my limbs. I had what they call muscle atrophy. So my arms would spring out on their own and I couldn't do anything about it. I was supposed to be in a wheelchair for my entire life. When I came out of the womb, they put me on a respirator because I was unable to breathe for myself. and I didn't have the strength. And so the respirator was keeping me alive for eight weeks. And my dad had tapes of him preaching next to my bed and thousands of people all over the world praying for me. And there was about 22 other babies that were in the NICU with me that all had issues. Every single one of them died. And one night when no nurse or anybody was there, it wasn't a shift when anybody was watching me, somehow the tubes were pulled out of my mouth that was pretty incredible because my arms were taped down. So still to this day, they don't know what to think or how the tubes got pulled out of my mouth. I know it was an angel of God that came in and literally pulled the tubes out of my mouth. I mean, so the doctor comes in the next day and he's like, hey, um, I know that you think your son's all better, but if you take him home, he's going to die. He needs everything, every bit of what we got. And my dad said, God doesn't heal halfway. If God began it, God will finish it. And he took me home that day, and they had damaged my vocal cords so bad I had no voice. Uh, when they put the tubes down, they were trying to keep me alive, and they destroyed everything. So I was said I would be mute for my entire life. So for the first two years, I slept inside of a glass crib. And when I'd cry, I'd make no noise. So my mom would have to see me through the glass. And after about two years, God gave me a vocal cord box again. And we all know why that is. I don't know if you know why that is, but the enemy, remember, comes to attack the very things you're going to destroy his kingdom with. 
Don't ever forget that. The very areas that he comes and attacks in your life, once you are delivered and free, become ministries in the hands of God. Your chains, once they're broken, become keys to other people's lives to unlock in the very same areas that you were touched in by Satan. So I'm there and uh, I get a vocal cord box, but I have severe bronchitis. And the reason why I really wanted to read this scripture to a lot of y'all is that did not go away right away. Sometimes when we've been preaching now about abundant life, and we've been hearing that there's no lack. There needs to be no lack in our life. God wants no lack. It is the truth what we're saying. But many of you might have been listening to this service and saying, well, I am in lack, you know. I was in lack. I, you know, I was not healed. I remember that every single winter I would wake up and I could not breathe. I had no air. And because every single winter in Texas, I'd wake up and I thought I was going to die. But my mom would put me in the car and... I'd stick my head out the window and we'd drive about 70 miles an hour, 60 to 70 miles an hour, down the highway until air started flowing in my lungs. She'd try everything. There was steam. I mean, we tried everything. But I was sure. <laughs> I, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I could not get air. And I'm like, I'm going to die as a kid just growing up. I remember this. And so if you would look at my life, I wasn't living the abundant life in that area of my life. I was in lack. And maybe you're sitting there and you've been hearing this entire series all month. And you're saying, well... I'm really glad for all those people who are going to have this, but I'm in lack. Maybe you felt that there's something wrong with you because you're in lack. Maybe you felt bad about it. Maybe you felt shamed. And I just want to tell you something. We've never once said during this entire series, and I want to clear this up, that because you recognize a lack in your life, that God is mad at you or there's anything wrong with you. But what we have said is that do not settle thinking it's God's best. Just because you are sick doesn't mean you have to stay that way. Just because you are depressed does not mean that's all there is in life for you. There is better ahead. There is better days ahead. The best still is actually yet to still come for you. So I just want to encourage everyone... I want to say this ahead of time before we get into this word. I felt the Spirit tell me. I just want to reach out with the love of God to you. I want you to hear the heart of God for you. He is not angry. He is not upset. As a matter of fact, the entire reason you've been in all of these services is because he's trying to remind you of how much he loves you, how much he has for you, and if you will partner with him on it, your life can change. There is no use in wallowing in the past or worrying about the mistakes that you've already made. It is time to stand up because the righteous man falls down six times, the Bible said, but the Lord raises him up again. I don't care if your sixth time is the 2,000th time. It doesn't matter if your sixth time is the 3,000th time. But I do know this. There is a last time. There is a last time that you fall. There is a last time that you succumb to this. There is a last day that you will be depressed. There is a last moment that you will be sick. There is a last time. Because God is always there to raise you back up. Do you hear me tonight? Are you ready to move on with your future? Because that's all God cares about. He's not looking in the rearview mirror. Do you notice how the front window is way bigger than the rearview mirror? Why? Because you don't need to be wasting time looking at what you did, being guilty about all the things that are wrong, the fact that you don't got what everybody else has. Why don't you get rid of it all, start brand new with God, and say, I'm ready to take my future and live the abundant life. It's for you, not just for the person to your left, not just for the person to your right. Don't deflect God's love any longer. Because you don't feel you deserve it doesn't mean God won't still keep trying to give you it. He's going to hunt you down with his love until the day you die. I just want you to know that. He's going to hunt you down with his blessing. He's going to try to get to you. I don't care if you run out of your home. I don't care if you run into the streets. He'll find you in a corner. He'll find you in an alleyway. He'll find you in a drug uh, rehab. He'll find you when you're overdosed and about to die. He'll find you in a... You cannot outrun the love of God. 
I don't care if you feel you deserve it. I don't care. You need to get over yourself. You need to get over yourself. I understand. But you understand what you're doing? You're still making yourself the center of your world. You're just idolizing your failures. But remember when Peter denied Jesus? Do you remember when he did it? He said he'd never do it. Do you remember when he failed? He did it. He did it three times. He didn't just do it once. He did it three times. You know what Jesus says to him? Do you remember the conversation? They're sitting by the fire. Jesus resurrects. You know the first thing goes to Peter? Do you love me? Yeah, you know I love you, God. One, do you love me? Yeah, you know I love you, God. Two, do you love me? Yeah, yeah, God, you know I love you. And he starts breaking at the heart. It said he was cut. But he needed Peter to say because three times he denied him. He wanted Peter to hear with his own mouth three times that he loved him. And Jesus says, guess what you need to do now? Just feed my sheep. Jesus does not make a memorial to your failures. He goes ahead and cleans you up and says, let's get moving on with your future. All right. Are you ready for the word today? I'm going to read a scripture and then we're going to pray very quick. Deuteronomy 15, 4 through 8. Man, I feel the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I'm so grateful for God. Here's the scripture. Please pay attention. This is God's word speaking to you. This is not just anything. This is a living book. This is for you. However, there will be no poor among you. This is God speaking. And he says to his own people, I don't want anybody poor among my people. Since the Lord will most certainly bless you in the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance possess, if only you will listen and obey the voice of your God and observe carefully all these commandments why I am commanding you. When the Lord your God blesses you as he has promised, then you will lend to many nations, but you will not borrow. You will rule over many nations, but they will not rule over you. Somebody should be saying amen. If there is a poor man among you, one of your fellow Israelites in any of your cities in the land and the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not be heartless, listen to these words, nor close-fisted with your brother, but you shall, watch this, freely open your hand to him and shall generously lend to him whatever he needs. Let's pray. God of heaven. I just thank you, Lord, that you take over this moment, this service, this time. We dedicate every word I'm about to say. Move right now. Begin healing hearts. I know you've already started beginning touching lives. Empower somebody who's weak right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, God. There is in your life a blessing God wants to give you. But the blessings God gives you are not meant just for you. There is a posture of receiving blessings that God puts us in and that the Bible talks about. It's the posture of either a closed fist or an open hand. A closed fist is something, somebody who receives a blessing but is in so much fear of never having a blessing like that again or losing something. Or they're in a mindset where they do not deserve anything good. So the moment they get something good, they hold on to it so tightly. And what happens is you're not just blocking it from other people. When you hold on to it, you're blocking it from God himself. Because what Jesus does is he gives you blessings and he multiplies them while they're in your hand. So that you can pass them from yourself into everyone around you. Jesus took the bread, the five loaves, and the two fish, and watch what he did with it. He looked up to heaven, he blessed it, and then he simply broke it, and he gave it. Jesus was hungry, just like all the other 5,000 men, not to mention women and children, were. He could have just taken the bread and eaten it. He could have taken the thing that he knew, but nobody else knew, was about to be enough to feed almost 15,000 people with 12 baskets left over. But because he understood the power is not in me getting something so I can just have it, the power is in me having something so I can multiply it to give it. 
So he realized the reason I am blessed is because I want to be a siphon of blessing. I want to be a place where God hits me because the moment he hits me, I'm good soil. Therefore, it multiplies when it touches me. When God gives me wisdom, it multiplies. So I don't just have enough wisdom for myself. I have enough wisdom now for everyone who comes around me the moment I need it. God wants to give us blessings and anointing. So not just so you can be healed, but he heals you and he leaves his fingerprint on you. Remember, if you have been touched by God, the fingerprint of the almighty is still on you. That fingerprint, just by the fact that it belongs to the creator, keeps on creating. The fact that the blessing has touched you is matter of fact saying that the blessing wants to quantify because anything God touches, look what he does. He simply touches it to begin it. But the moment he touches it, it becomes more and more and more and more. He doesn't have to make it more. He simply touches it once and it quantifies on its own. Why? Because there is creativity in the fingerprint of God. Hear what I'm saying? He just touches it. And then he just starts breaking it. He doesn't worry that there's anything. He doesn't need a lot of baskets there. He just starts breaking it and he starts handing it out. If you and I were looking at the bread that he was breaking in his hands, you'd say, well, there goes half and half. But he reaches back and then there's another half. And then there's another half. And then there's another half. Now we got a whole basket full of halves. Okay, we look at that fish. Okay, I'm watching this fish. He breaks the fish apart. Okay, it's definitely in half. Why has he got another half all of a sudden? Where's that half coming from? Where's that? Because you don't understand being in the hands of Jesus quantifies you. It doesn't minimize you. Anything that God touches begins to create on its own. The residue of God's touch has a creative power inside of it that it continues to create and to form. Remember, when God said, let there be light, it's not the first time that light existed. Because whenever God wills something, when he wants something, the moment he wants it, it is. The moment he wills it, it exists. That's why it said, let there be light. The word let means allow it to happen again. Because in the spirit realm, it already existed. But when God willed it, it existed. When God spoke it, it became. Please understand what I'm saying. If God has taken the time to tell you something, give you a promise, speak into your life, it's because it already exists in the spirit. He's spoken it to you and it only takes your power of agreement and one act of obedience to release the becoming. Are you tracking with what I'm saying? In other words, it's only the open-handed people who know how to handle blessing that God will trust with blessing. You don't wait till you get out of debt in order to start paying other people's. You don't wait till you get out of debt to start giving. You don't wait till you get out of a place of depression to start helping somebody else who's depressed. You don't wait till you feel perfect one day in order to get up and start helping and serving. You don't wait for that. Why? Because you understand if God has given you a promise that you will have peace, that you will have joy, that you have freedom, it already exists. It's only a matter of time until you run into something that God has already put there. Do you remember when we talked about time? God is already in the future. So he can't say anything that isn't already there. It's impossible for God to lie. He doesn't have a theory of telling you something. Everything God says, it's only because it's already proven to be true. So how could God tell you a promise unless it's already in the future He's watching you in the promise and he's speaking from the future backwards towards you and asking you to take one step of faith, one seed to plant, one thing to do so he can get you to where he already is. God has a will for your life. Would everybody agree with this? 
That means, Psalm 139 calls it the plan. He says the plan has already been written. Every single page of your book, David said, has already been written. All my life has already been written in your book. That is God's will. That plan is his will. Remember, if he wills it, it exists. So it exists in the spirit. But God waits for men and women who understand the principle of knowing that there is a moment that God will ask you to not be closed with something, but to trust him in order to give something. Once you obey God with your part, God releases into the tangible where you can feel it, see it, and have it. But you have to understand, he's simply waiting on one small act of your obedience. Because he's already standing there with your breakthrough. He's already standing there with what you need. He wants to manifest it because he spoke it. But he waits for us to agree with him, number one, with our own mouths. And number two, make the step of obedience to obey the principle that will release what already is into existence into your life. Let me give you an example. We have here uh, the widow and Elisha. Think about this. Elisha comes to a widow one day, and the widow is in need. And he comes, and she needs a miracle. So Elisha says something. Look at these words. He says, what do you have in your house? He doesn't say, what can you go ahead and manifest after three months of prayer? He doesn't say, what are you going to have after you get your life clean and you straighten up and you're going to be in a place in six months, you've already gone through all the Holy Warriors classes, you've done everything, right? And you're, you're, you're presentable now. You're at least acceptable to God. He doesn't say that. He says, in your life, in your present state, in your poverty, in your place of lack, in your place of nothing, what do you got that you can offer God? Many of you are still thinking there's greener grass on the other side. Many of you are still believing that if you just had that wife, you could be happy. If you just had that relationship, if you just had, man, if you just had an opportunity like he had, or if you just had this person like this person had, if you just had something outside of yourself, your situation would change. But God doesn't work with anything outside of yourself. He asks for what you already have. So he comes to her and he says this. He says, what do you got? She says, all I got is a bunch of empty jars. All I got is a bunch of empty vessels. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 65, it says there will be people who have this open-handed mentality who will not work in vain. Anything they have efforts for, it will not be wasted. And their children will not be doomed to misfortune. In other words, when you start figuring out how to handle God's blessing, God will then surpass you and overflow onto your family. For they are blessed people by the Lord, and their children too will be blessed. Watch this. I will answer them before they even call to me. <laughs> While they are still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. Listen to these words again. Remember about time. While they're still talking about their needs, I'll go ahead of them and answer their prayers in their future. I'm already there. It's what Jesus is saying. I'm already there. You got to hear what I'm saying. Your kids, they're already there in God's eyes. They're already broken through of that drug addiction in God's eyes. They're already free in God's eyes. You're off of alcohol in God's eyes. You're not falling to that temptation in God's eyes. Are you hearing me? Why? Because I know it's not his will for you to be bound. So because it's not his will, there is already a free you that exists. It already exists. But he's waiting on something. He's waiting for you to present empty Vessels, not half full, not Lord, I got this, why don't you just help me with this? Not Lord, you know, I feel, still feel I got some tricks on my own sleeve, I'm going to keep doing this my own way. That's not an empty vessel. There are people in this room who are hungry enough for change that you have tried it your own way for long enough and you're ready for something to shift. 
You have done your own way. You've tried to get out of debt your own way. You've tried to get happy your own way. You've tried to get power your own way. You try to control your wife. You try to control your husband. You try to control your kids. You try to control everyone around you because you know you're losing grip on everything around you and you're scared. So this is what God does. He comes to you because he loves you, not because he has to. <laughs> and he comes to you not because he's obligated, but because he loves you. And he says, what do you got for me? Is there anything I can use? Please understand that that morning, the widow woke up and she would have looked through her pantry. She would have looked at all the jars. There's no flour in there. There's, there's no flour in here. There's no sugar. There's no meal. There, I ain't got no bread. No, nothing in there. I, there's nothing there. And she would have woke up that morning. There's nothing. But she didn't realize that the very jars she was looking at in that morning were about to be filled to such a place she would never need to fill them ever again. The very thing you're looking at right now in your life that seems like it's presenting nothing, my kids, nothing, my sister's getting further away from me than she's ever been. My daughter's not seeming to catch what I'm trying to tell her about God. My finance, I'm just getting into more debt. My business isn't getting any better, yet we're talking about the abundant life. All this, the very same issues and circumstances you're looking at and they're empty. With one act of obedience, by tomorrow morning, some of y'all could have a total different reality. I want you to watch this story real quick and get exactly what I'm saying. Please play that testimony and I'll be right back. My name is Liz Singh and I've been coming to The Way for over a year and a half. So I was presented a giving opportunity, but before the giving opportunity here at The Way, um, my husband had just got saved and giving was a, a different subject for us that we hadn't really talked about just because he was new to the faith. And when we were presented the giving opportunity, we were a little bit fearful, a little bit nervous. We were thinking of our bills, like what are some things I can use that money for? And I just remember uh, being in that state, but we were also excited at the same time because it was something new for us. It was something that uh, we hadn't uh, had a giving opportunity before. And I remember preparing for that day. My husband was really excited. Uh, I remember he didn't want to give a direct deposit. He actually wanted to give a cash envelope because he felt it was that much of an impact. And it was 11 o'clock service. And my husband, uh, he brought his envelope so that we can give our first giving offering. And I remember we gave, we were faithful, you know, we were like, you know what, God, we're putting this uh, for your kingdom. We're putting this in your hands. We're a little bit nervous, but we're like, this is for God's glory. So we're going to go ahead and do it but at 11 o'clock and right at 1.30 or after the two o'clock service, which is Spanish, uh, someone asked me, how do you spell your name? And I was like, for what? And then they told me, um, I have a check here that's for you. And it was four times the amount that I had given at 11 o'clock. And so when we saw that, we were like, what? This is crazy. It almost felt like God was saying, here, I don't, I don't need your money. You know, thank you for what you did at 11, but it's two o'clock. Here you go. Here's four times the amount, the money that you gave. And we have a business, myself and my husband, and that was on a Sunday. From Monday to Friday, we had really big checks, almost four times the amount as well as what we had gave. Um, hit our account every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And really what that did for us, uh, it just it gave us hope, you know. It showed us that God doesn't really need our money, we need Him. You know, we need our faith in Him. And it showed us what giving can do for our lives. And ever since, you know, we had that giving experience here at The Way, our life dramatically changed. We're uh, active givers, we're faithful givers, and we give with a cheerful heart because we understand that God, that He loves the cheerful giver, and He can give it back to us like nothing before. Come on, give God a hand. At 11 o'clock, she's told and challenged by God to give. But at 2.30 that same day, God already had a check for four times the amount waiting for her. But listen, if she would not have obeyed in the moment, here's what I'm trying to say. You have no idea the blessing that is waiting right there for you. 
that is right there. The breakthrough you've been asking is closer than you think. The things that you need are closer than you think. But God requires us to sow something. Sow joy into somebody if you want to get off of depression. Sow freedom into somebody if you want to get off drugs. Sow healing into someone if you want to get healed. There is something that God has for you. But he already has it and he's waiting with the breakthrough. But he's waiting for you to give him something that he can fill. You have a part to play. You see, Abraham went up to the mountain. And it said that Mount Moriah was there. And Abraham was going to go up and crucify, torture, or kill his son. And as they're going up, can you imagine, remember those days, that one side of the mountain, Abraham is going up. He wakes up in the morning, and God tells him this. But he had no idea that as he was walking up the mountain, days before, there was already also a ram walking up the other side. He had no clue that as he was coming up the mountain, hoping that God would change his mind, hoping this could not be God's will, just feeling like, did I hear this wrong? But he just was like, I'm just going to do this. I know what God said. Can you imagine taking your own son up to the top, who is the son of promise? But at the same time he's coming up one side of the mountain, the provision for what he needs is coming up the other side. Matter of fact, it was already waiting for him there before he even got there. Did you just hear what I said? The provision was already waiting, but he had to still obey. You do not get to see the blessings God already has for you until you obey where you're standing. Let me say that again. You never get to see the blessing God has for you in your future till you obey right where you're standing. Do you remember that there was a time when Jesus walked out and those Pharisees came up and said, why don't you pay taxes? What's going on with this? And everybody else does it. And do you believe you should pay tax? Jesus already saw this coming because when Jesus woke up that morning and was having his breakfast, he already heard it in his ear. Do you know what he was hearing? He was hearing a fish. They didn't know it, but the moment Jesus woke up, the provision for what he needed was already swimming. And when he walked up and the Pharisees asked him, The moment they asked him was the perfect collision of God's will and timing. Because the moment they asked him, look at this. He says, Peter, just take a hook. You don't even need any bait. Just take a hook and go right over there. Not go on the other side of the lake. Not go over there. Just walk right over there. Because the fish was already sent to the very moment I knew the question would be asked. God already went ahead of me and the coin will be in the fish's mouth and we can give it to these Pharisees just so we don't offend them today. But just know you don't need any bait. Just get over there and right there. Can you imagine of all the places in the lake, the fish showed up in the one proximate place where the question would be asked. Because there are some people in this building who God's about to move in your behalf because you're partnering with him that before you even ask, God will go ahead of you, and he's going to answer your prayers. Moses is out in the middle of the wilderness, y'all. The desert of Shur. There ain't nothing out there. That is the desert of Shur. There's no trees. I don't see any greenery going on. And he goes up to to a water, and all the Israelites are thirsty, and they try to drink, and it's so disgusting they can't drink. It's called the waters of Marah. And the Bible says that he looks to his right, and there's a tree there. There's a tree there, and he says, there's a tree here in the desert. He pulls up the tree, throws it in the water, and it makes the water able to drink. Remember that in the desert, only trees grow up to even two feet. In the desert, takes three years. Two feet in this desert, three years. And it's so unlikely that a seed will ever take root, you don't see any greenery. But in the very place that they would feel an issue, please understand what I'm saying. They hadn't even been out in the wilderness for three years yet. That means that while they were being whipped by their taskmasters, while they were still serving Pharaoh, 
while they were still making blocks, God already had a seed that was rolling in the desert. Before they even were set free, God was already growing a tree in the place that they would have a need. Before they even got to the problem, God was already there. God has provided a tree for you. He's provided an answer, but he waits for you to obey in the place where you're standing. I'll give you a couple more examples and I'm going to close. And we're going to have the worship team come back out tonight. There's a woman called Ruth in the Bible. And it said, it's one of my favorite books of the Bible. It's only a few chapters. You should read it. It says that she goes with Naomi. She clings to this woman. And she goes into this new town. She doesn't know anything about her future. She's given up on it. Her husband's died. There's nobody there for her. She really believes she's going to go with this woman and die. Yet she shows up to this place. And the Bible says this amazing statement. Hear this. It says that as she was walking, she looks at Naomi and says, I better get work somewhere. So I'm going to try to go and get in one of these fields and sneak into one of these fields and hopefully become a worker so we can eat and not die. I'll try to bring home some food tonight. And she says, God, go with you. So she walks and it says she happened to stumble into the place that Boaz was working. You got to understand what's happening here. The Bible calls it stumbling. The Bible says the words happened to stumble. Boaz was the kingsman redeemer that was already in her family. Boaz was the one person who could provide for her. Boaz was the one man who would not kill her. Boaz was the one field in hundreds of fields that if she found that one field, and the Bible said she happened to stumble into the place. There's no happening with God. There's no it happened. You're going to be saying that about your life. I happened to be in the right place at the right time. I happened to be there when that person was there and I shook their hands and I got a promotion I never thought was going to happen. I happened to show up in this place. I happened to be in Walmart. And the moment I was in Walmart, I saw that person and they happened to talk to me who got me connected to this. Place. You're going to have a lot of happenings going to go on in your life because once God takes control of your steps, he's already gone ahead of you. You might feel you're stumbling into the place, but God already had the place reserved for you. He already had the seat reserved for you. Nobody else could take the place of your blessing. He's already been waiting there for you. Whew, I hope you're catching what I'm saying tonight. I want to encourage those of you who feel you've messed up. And you feel that you've been disqualified. And you feel that because of the mistakes you've made, there's no way you could have this abundant life we're talking about. I want to remind you of Jonah. Jonah was a man who God called. And he knew what God said and intentionally ran away. Anybody ever guilty of that in here? Nobody? Nobody? Oh, okay, we got some honest people in here. That you know God said something and you went the other direction. Talk about disqualification. Talk about a reason not to be wet. But watch this. Even in the midst of a storm, God already had a whale swimming. <laughs> Even if you think you're disqualified, I want to tell you something tonight. The mercy of God is still chasing after you. You might be having storms. I get it because disobedience is going to bring storms into your life. However, whether you caused the storms or somebody else did, I want you to jump off of the boat. I want you to get in the water and trust that God will take you to the place you need to be. You're not too far from God's plan. You're not too far out of God's mercy. He's waiting for you. Are you going to obey where you're standing? Are you going to reach out in faith? where you're sitting right now. What do you have already in your house? You don't need anything else. What can you obey with today? Peter is on the boat, last story. And he's in the boat and he's been fishing all night. You know the story, Jesus comes, he's tired, he's rowing in, he's done, right? He's done, he's been the whole entire night like, He's done the left side, he's done the right side, he's done the front of the boat, he's done the back of the boat, he's done that side of the lake, that side of the lake, I mean, he's done everything. He's a professional fisherman, so he even knows what he's doing, and he's caught nothing. Some of y'all, you've been working on your family members, you're feeling nothing. You've been trying to invite your sister to church for three years, she still ain't coming. Listen to what I'm about to say. 
You've been trying to get free of that addiction. You hate it about yourself. You're so full of shame. You're so full of guilt. You're so tired of falling again and again and again. You hate it about yourself. You're trying to get freedom, but you're throwing out the net and nothing's coming in. You're throwing out faith and it's not happening. You're trying it, but just nothing's meeting you. You're feeling what's going on, God. Jesus stepped into the boat. Listen to the words he said. This is a prophetic word for you. Listen and hear this in your spirit. He said, cast out the net again. <laughs> cast out the net again. Throw it out again. I understand. I understand it looks impossible with your family. I understand what your mother and your father did to you. I couldn't even understand the story if you were to tell me. I understand the friends that you think are impossible. I understand the places, but please don't forget what my mother said the other day. Don't underestimate the power of the seed. Don't underestimate. You got to throw it out again. I'm challenging you in your spirit today. Would you cast it out again? Would you throw it out again? Peter says something. He says, at your word. You see, it's not at somebody else. It's not going to be good enough. When you're tired and when you're worn out and you've tried this thing and you've been going and you feel like God literally is blessing everybody but you and you have enough reasons to truly give up. When you're at that place in your life and all you can think about are all the reasons why it makes sense for you not to keep going. You don't need anybody else's word at that moment. You only need the word of God himself. And he says, throw it out again. Somebody in here needs to know, you still got a net in your hands. I understand it's calloused. I understand your hands are broken. I understand they're bleeding. I understand that they're open and they're seeping at the wounds. I understand the work and the raggedness you might feel. But Jesus is now in your boat. Jesus is talking to you. You didn't have him the same way before. You weren't in the same place before. And if you obey, if you're partner with him, he's saying, I'm speaking now. I'm speaking now. Throw it out again. But look what he says. Look what he says. He doesn't say cast out your net. Singular. Cast out your nets. <laughs> he doesn't say cast out your net because Jesus doesn't want you to just get what you asked for. He wants you to get way more than you ever could have bargained for. He wants to give you the 12 baskets left over. He wants to give you your entire family saved, not just your sister. He wants to give it all to you. Cast out your nets. Cast out your nets. Cast out. I know that you thought this is all I could do, but let me show off for you a little bit, my son. Let me just show off for you a little bit, my daughter. I know you just thought this is all, but he said the moment that he said, listen to this, the moment Jesus said, cast out your nets, you have to understand what happened. Jesus is not like any other man. When he speaks, it's not like the voice of any other man. So when Jesus speaks, it's the voice of the creator himself. It's the voice that was there before time began. It's the voice that spoke and said, waters be. It's the voice that spoke and said, fish become. It's the voice that spoke. So the moment he said, cast out your nets, every single fish in that lake, in the Indian Ocean, in the Arctic Sea, in the Pacific Ocean, in the Atlantic Ocean, were all headed for that net. Those fish just happened to be the first ones who got there. And they pulled in so much. Whew. Come on. They pulled in so much. Their boats began to sink. Why? Because Jesus never made a blessing. Just only. That was just for you. He made it to be on you and flow through you. More than enough. Somebody say it. More than enough. Say it again. More than enough. You got to say this over yourself. More than enough. Come on. More than enough. Over here. More than enough. You got to release your mind. I understand you've been poor. I understand it hasn't worked. But Jesus has not been in your boat at the time he is now. And he's telling you again. Cast out your nets. See, it was never about your power. It was never about your ability. It was never about all the things you could do to try to impress God. It was about you listening for his voice. Can you hear his voice? 
Because once he speaks, his voice has all the summoning power that you need for everything you're looking for. If Peter said it, no fish are coming. But if Jesus said it, every fish is on its way. That's why you come to church. That's why you want to be in the house of God. Because God might speak to you. God might give you a promise. God might put a deposit in you. And when you get a deposit in you, you leave this building with a summoning power for all the things you're asking for. You become a magnet for blessing. What did David say? I love this. Surely goodness and mercy will follow. That word follow means to hunt down with a hostile pursuit. Listen to that. The Hebrew means to hunt down with a hostile pursuit. God puts his red dot on you and he's snipering you. Once you agree with God. All right, I got to close. There is an if clause, y'all, an if clause. If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will heal their land. If you don't humble yourself and you don't pray, you can't expect anything to change. There's an if clause. There's only one thing. God doesn't ask. Listen, God never asks you to do anything supernatural. Did you ever notice that? He only asks you to do something natural that you can do. And then he does the things you can't do. He's not asking you to do more than you can do. If, if my word abide in you and you abide in me, you can ask whatever you want in my father's name and he'll give it to you. Well, you can just ask for whatever you want, but you aren't having it. Why? Because his word has to first be abiding in you. And you have to be abiding in his word. Psalm 91 is a huge chapter that we all quote. If they fall at my right side, they fall at my left side, all these things. But did you read verse 1 and 2? He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. All the promises are only for dwellers, not for visitors. There's an if clause. God is ready to give you blessings that you don't even know how to ask for. Can I just say that? You don't even know how to articulate what you need. Some of you just know you need something. You just need a change. You don't even know how to express it. God knows how to meet it. He is the equal sign to your equation. Jesus is the equal sign to your equation. Exodus 14, 13, and 16. And here we go. We're closing here, and I'm going to pray for you. Worship team, please come back out. Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord. This is when Pharaoh is chasing them and they're caught at the Red Sea. Watch this, they're caught at the Red Sea. And Pharaoh's right behind him. He says to the people, don't worry. The Lord's going to rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Then the Lord said to Moses, look at this. Why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff. Raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so we can cross and go on dry ground. There is a time for weeping and praying. And then there's a time for doing it. There's a time for asking it. And then there's a time for stepping out in faith and doing it. Moses is on his knees crying out to God again. And God said, I told you in that cave. I told you in Exodus chapter 4 that I would deliver all these people. I told you at that moment. Why are you trying to ask me again? It's your time to move now. It's not your time to cry out. It's your time to trust me now. It's not your time to keep begging. It's your time to act in obedience. It's not your time to keep trying to shout and say if something changes. It's time to move. It's time to walk. It's time to be in faith. It's time to step up. It's time to say, Lord, I want my life to not just be another life of a Christian who stayed depressed. I don't want my life to be another life of a man who stayed bound, yet I claimed I was a Christian. It's time to walk. 
It's time to say my entire house will be saved. It's time to not settle for anything less. It's time to not settle for your kids in this place anymore. It's time to not settle. Every eye closed. He won't fail me now. He won't fail me now. Close your eyes. Sing that, Daria. Oh, he won't fail. He won't fail. He won't fail. He won't. He won't. Let him talk to you. He's not going to fail. He's not going to fail. He's not going to fail. He won't. You won't, God. You won't fail. He won't fail. He won't. Let me ask you this question. Every person here. There are few opportunities that you get in life where you have a divine moment that meets the present time you're in and collides. Those are called the defining moments of our life. Those are the moments we remember that God said something. We chose to listen and obey. And for the rest of your life, you talk about those moments that God changed your life. One of those is when you got saved. One of those is maybe when you got filled with the Holy Spirit. One of those is maybe when you got married. Who knows what the days are? Defining moments. I feel God saying that for many of us in this building and many people who are also watching online, I feel God speaking to you. There is a defining moment God has planned before you were born and it is about to collide with your present. This is a hand-picked moment by God that he is waiting for you. He just wants you to approach him with an open hand, not a closed hand. Are you waiting for something to change in your life? Are you waiting for somebody to apologize? Or are you waiting for something else to happen? If or you were to be honest and you say, you know, yeah, I... I think I'm good, you know, I, I just don't see where I've fallen and I'm really waiting for somebody else to change or something in my business to shift. Can I challenge you today that God is bigger than all the problems you're facing right now. They are nothing for him. He's not surprised by any of them. And that there is maybe something that is in your hand right now that God is asking in obedience because he wants to give you a blessing that has already been waiting for you but he wants you to come with an open hand. It's a heart of trust. It's a place that has confidence again in God that doesn't give up on him, even though everyone else might have given up on you. On December 11th, we're having one of these defining moments. It's not about money. It's not even about us taking something and having something in a church. It's, we call it the breakthrough offering. The reason why we call that is because we believed in prayer that God told us that for many people, the moment they release and see whatever God tells you, it could be a release of something in your life that God wants. Remember, he'll always require you to sow a seed to be able to get the thing he already had for you. He'll always require a small obedience. Liz's story, we saw it. She was asked to give, they were afraid, they were nervous. But three hours later, there was already something four times better than they even gave. More incredible than they could have ever imagined. They didn't see it. They didn't know what was going to happen. But her and her husband joined hands and they said, you know what? We're just going to obey. We're just going to trust God. I want every one of us to really be thinking about December 11th. In your heart, are you truly asking God, what is it that I need to give? 
What is it that's on the line for your family? Maybe it's a family member, whatever it is. It's not about the fact God doesn't need your money. He's waiting for you to trust him. But when you sow a seed, there is a powerful response. I'm going to ask for the ability to agree with you on one of the most amazing things that's ever happened. Jesus coming to earth, dying for your sins, raising from the dead so we could have this moment right now. I'm asking if you do not know Jesus, if you have never received him as your Lord and Savior, maybe you heard me today and something jumped out at you and you say, but I don't know this God. I'm not sure if this Jesus is my Lord. Maybe you received him at one time, but you're not serious about God. And you say, I want to get serious again about Jesus. If this is your first time or you're rededicating to Jesus is what we call it. I want you unashamed right now. One, two, three, to lift your hands. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Look at these hands. Look at these hands. Look at these hands. Say, I want Jesus. <laughs> I want to get serious about Jesus. Lift your hands. Right where you're at, would you stand right where you're at? Stand up, come on, give him a hand, stand up. If you lift your hand, don't be shy now. Don't be shy now, stand up where you are. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Every soul, yes, yes. Right now, as you're in your seats, I wanna pray for you for this prayer while you're in your seats because we're about to have one last moment. And I want this to be open for that moment. If you're there, do I have permission to pray for you? Would you just wave your hand if I do? Could I pray with you? Do I have the permission? Okay. Do I have permission to pray for, for you guys and agree with you? Yes, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Do I have permission over here? What's up, man? Thank you so much. Do I have permission? Yes, thank you. Everybody closing your eyes. Let's say this prayer, especially you who are standing right now. I want you to say this prayer out loud and make sure it's loud enough you can hear yourself say it. Because what's about to happen is you're about to be made brand new. You're about to be born again. And after this moment, I want you to dedicate to Jesus your entire life. More people are standing up. Thank you so much. I want you to say that I'm going to become a true disciple. I'm not just going to stop here. All of us pray in this prayer together. Dear Jesus, I need you. I love you. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for shedding your blood so I could be saved. God, I turn my life over to you. I never want to be the same. I want you to become the boss. Tell me about my schedule. Tell me what to do with my children. Tell me what to do with my life. I hand it fully over to you. And I thank you that from this moment forward, my past is forgotten. My future is bright. And I walk forward with you. Thank you for saving me. I'm no longer guilty. I'm no longer guilty. I am no longer guilty. But I am saved. I am a citizen of heaven. And I'm going to become your disciple. Come on, give him a hand right now. Give him a hand. Give him a hand. Give him a hand. Give him a hand. Will everybody please stand to their feet real quick. We're going to sing this song, and I want you, in this moment, as we worship, to dig in. I want you to come to the front for some of you right now. If you have to leave, we thank you so much for that. Thank you for coming to the service. But there are some more of you who need to get something more. I feel that in my spirit. Come up here right now. If this is spoken to you, and you need to be filled with trust again. You need to be filled with strength again. You need to be filled with might again. Come up. Come up. God has something for you. Come on. Come on. Give my hand. You need more than just something. You need this to be down deep in your spirit. Come up. Come up. We have prayer, people. We're about to pray and agree with you. Come on up. Thank you, God. Everybody lifting your hands. Come on, close your eyes. I want you to begin, if you have a prayer language, to begin praying in the spirit right now. If you don't have a prayer language, begin praising God in English. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Awesome Father. Come on, make room for these people up here. Make room. Help them come around. Help them come around. Praise Him right now. Praise Him right now. Let's go in for just a couple more minutes. Let's go in for just a couple more minutes. Let God fill you with something. Christ is my firm foundation. Here we go. Christ is my 
firm foundation. It's up in the air. The rock on which I stand. Everybody up here in the front, hands lifted. Come on, let him touch you. He's about to start touching you. I want to invite you to one thing before you go. On December the 10th, two Saturdays from now, we are having a God encounter in this building. From 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., I'm going to show you how to grow your gifts, how to know what your gift is. I'm going to show you how to be led by the Holy Spirit. And God told me specifically, it was about two and a half or three months ago, we had a healing service that was outside on a Wednesday, and we haven't had the time to do that. There have been many miracles, a woman's bones, she was bowed legged they both moved. So many blind people, eyes were open that night. I'm gonna pray for the sick for a full hour on December the 10th, a full hour I'll pray for the sick. We're gonna agree with you because Jesus is a God of healing. I hope to see you there. Thank you all again, church. Please come to church on Sunday. It's gonna be incredible. Pastor Marco will be speaking. It's gonna be amazing. We love you all so much. You are dismissed and thank you again.